generous the C's extend pretty well into the 60 percent range um, the D's there's not that many people that are too far off from passing the class especially because you've got a comprehensive final coming up that's worth 200 points um, and that's it's worth two exams so um, it would be it'll actually be fairly fairly straightforward if you can do pretty well on the final to be able to pass the class. So the people who are in the D range shouldn't be panicking yet. Besides, if you're taking this for Gen Ed credit only, um, that D is is below average, but passing for Gen Ed. Okay. So, well, it reflects on your GPA. That's true. That's true. Um, but the people in the F range, which is at that point somewhere down around the low 50s and 40 percents and that sort of thing, um, should be thinking about withdrawing at this point. There's, it's very unusual to see someone um, come up from a composite score in that range and be able to pass the class. It's not unheard of. I think I've seen it once or twice in 10 years. So um, it doesn't happen very often. Um, there is, as I say, there is a comprehensive exam for the final, and it is 200 points. So you can significantly improve your grade if you do well on that. Um, you know, I've seen people jump from C's to B pluses, that sort of thing, off the final. Um, but you'll need to study. Now, I know there's some frustration among people about having studied their butts off. Um, studying your, your butt off um, often means, um, for some people, memorization. You may have memorized every word in the chapter. Um, actually, you should have done pretty well if you did that. But um, application is also very important. And that's why in the study guide, the practice um, exam questions are, or multiple choice questions, are separated into two sections, testing your knowledge and applying your knowledge. Um, application is, um, to me, much more important in some ways than um, simple memorization because that means that you're able to take what you've memorized and think critically about it and use it to solve the problem. That problem-solving ability is not something that gets developed a lot. Um, in your prior schooling, and so sometimes it's difficult for people to do. Um, that's one reason why um, the curve so far is fairly generous, because that sort of helps to take that into account. Um, and you know, some people just don't have aptitude for biology. There are things that, some things that we're good at, and some things that we're just not. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm just not very good at science. Well, you could be if you develop the, the thinking skills necessary. But um, I don't know if it brings you any comfort, but I don't trust myself to add 2 plus 2 without a calculator. I'm not very good at math. It's one reason I went into genetics, because I could just do applied arithmetic and not worry about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, especially the people who are in this sort of range and down here, I want to let you know, you know, you can bring that grade up. Don't panic. Um, it's not the end of the world. Okay, but um, people in this range should be thinking about um, withdrawing from the class. It's better than getting an F, especially if you've got um, financial aid, because that F is going to hurt your GPA and it's hard to uh, bring your GPA back up from an F. Whereas if you have a W, it doesn't hurt your GPA at all. If you've got financial aid and you drop down below full time, you'll go on financial aid probation for a term, but as long as you take a full time load next term, you're fine. Okay, that probationary status is removed. So that way you would not lose your financial aid. Um, and if you get an F, especially if you have um, sort of marginal grades in other classes too, then you're, you're hurting, especially for financial aid. They'll put you on financial aid probation pretty quickly. And if you've been on probation before, then it gets yanked. And you don't want to mess with that. Um, so
So, suggestions for studying. Um, several people have, have come to me and asked, you know, I studied a lot, and yet I didn't do very well. How can I improve? Um, one thing I've suggested to people is to outline the chapters as you're reading them. Many of the questions on the exams come from a test bank that's done straight from the information in the book. And while I cover a lot of the information uh, from the book in the lecture, there's still a significant amount that I don't cover. And so outlining the chapters is probably a real good way to go to help you focus on what the information is there. Um, thinking about the uh, questions at the end of the chapters, especially the essay questions, because a lot of those are application sorts of things. Um, doing the, the study guide, um, although some people have said that really isn't helping them much, it, it does. Um, especially if you approach it from the sense of you read that, that section in the chapter and then you set that aside and you try to do the study guide without referring back to the chapter. It helps you test yourself and it helps you think about what you still need to study. Um, using the CD-ROM in the book. I know last time I mentioned that a lot of people said, well, you can't sell the book back if, um, if you use the CD-ROM. Well, here's the question. Do you want to pass or do you want to sell your book back? Okay. Use that CD-ROM. There are, there are practice exams in that CD-ROM that have questions that have been taken from the same test bank that I'm using for my exams. Why do you think I've emphasized use that CD-ROM? So the question becomes, do you want to pass or do you want to get 10 bucks back for your book? Okay, that's the question. Um, so use those, but don't refer back to the book when you're doing them. Use them as practice exams, right? Read the chapters, study the chapters, um, study every day so that it stays in your, fresh in your memory. A lot of people will not study until, say, a week before the exam or a few days before the exam. It's too late, all right? You're screwed. You have got to study a little bit every day. That's why um, we figure that a, full, a load of 12 hours is a full-time occupation because it should take you 36 hours a week out of class. You should be spending at least an hour every day on this material in this class. Okay. If you do that, I think it'll help. Um, and beyond that, um, perhaps studying in a group of people where you can actually sit down and discuss what you've learned. Um, because discussing it helps you cement it uh, and understand it. it you, just, you don't learn stuff thoroughly unless you have to present it to someone else. I mean, I didn't really learn genetics um, in a practical sense until I actually had to stand up in front of a class of 200 people and present the information. Um, so that often helps. Perhaps if there's a uh, few people in your group that have been doing really well in the class, perhaps their study habits or tricks or whatever may rub off on you as well. And you might pick up some things that you can try um, for the final exam. <coughs> Okay, so those are some, some suggestions that, that hopefully will help you <coughs> study um, and do better on the final so that you could get through the class. Um, and as I say, ultimately, sometimes we just don't have an aptitude for, for math. Um, you know, the only classes, when I was an undergraduate, the only classes that I, I did poorly in were, um, were strong math-related courses, I and mean, I barely passed them. So, <clears throat> um, any other questions on that? Yes? Last time you gave us the answers for each form. Yeah, I'll do that as well. Um, I haven't, we haven't got the uh, exam forms ready to be returned yet. But yes, as soon as we get those, um, get those exams ready to return, then we'll go ahead and... Uh, We'll go ahead and, and hand that out, out that key so that you have it.
Well, and as I said also, this exam that you just took is probably the hardest one you'll take in the biology 100 sequence. The rest of them get a lot easier. The next one, I think the final will be quite a bit easier for you because the majority of it, 60%, is going to be um, on genetics. And genetics seem to be something that people have sort of an intuitive sense about. It, it relates to you better. You're able to see how it works better. Molecular stuff, you know, it's, it's tricky um, to try and figure out how everything's working. So um, that may help you as well do better on the final simply because the material is more um, directly relatable. It's easier to understand. We're pretty much done with dealing with molecular stuff for this term and the whole rest of it is going to be classical genetics. Okay. So um, that's, what we'll, that's the topic that we move into now. Um, chapters 8 and 9, classical genetics. Um, it's molecular and cellular basis but we really won't be looking too much at molecular stuff um, in this, this course. Next term, the first thing we start up on is molecular genetics and looking at you know, what is a gene? How does DNA work? Um, what are, what's the functional implications of that? And then uh, we'll look at a lot of the uh, genetic engineering and, and molecular cloning and that sort of things that people are really interested in right now. Um, one note on this material though, uh, I use a historical approach and I've, I've said that several times with genetics. Um, and I sort of implied it when I uh, did that brief history of genetics last week. So I move pretty freely between chapters 8 and 9, but I'll do 9 first, then I'll move to 8, and then we'll go back to 9 and uh, finish it off. Okay, so I'll try to let you know where I'm moving back and forth so you can follow along reasonably well. All right, some major points about these two chapters. They really can be condensed into three major points. And that first point is there are some basic rules of inheritance that were discovered by mostly Gregor Mendel um, in the 1850s. And <coughs> they were um, expanded on by other people once his work was rediscovered in the, at the turn of the century, the, uh, 1898, 99. Uh, until about 1953. 1953 was a hallmark year because that's when the structure of DNA was determined. And at that point we hit the molecular revolution. And so a lot of genetics goes to the molecular level at that point. All right, so there's some basic rules of inheritance that you'll want to learn. Applying those rules is going to get you through all of the genetics problems that you'll see. It's a basic matter of knowing the basic rules um, being able to apply those to solving problems. And so here's where application becomes very, very important. But what I plan on doing is going through an awful lot of problems so I can show you how you apply that, um, that basic knowledge to solving the problems. All right. um, the cell division chapter talks about two different types of cell division, mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is the um, process of equally separating genetic information into daughter cells. You have uh, cells that divide, they've um, duplicated their genetic information, they divide that evenly between the daughter cells. Okay. And that's typical cell division. There is a special type of cell division though that is called meiosis and that's used to produce sex cells, sperm and egg. Okay. That division halves the genetic material so that there's only half as much in each of the cells. Okay. So the basic rules of inheritance and then the two types of cell division are what basically these two chapters are involved with. All right, this is um, the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. I've, um, I've alluded to him before. Um, he was um, he had a, a really hard childhood. Um, he was depressed a lot. He lay in bed for you know, days, weeks at a time. There was one period in time uh, when he came home from school and he just basically laid in bed for a year. He was so depressed he couldn't get, he couldn't get up. Um, his parents were not very tolerant of that. They uh, chastised him, and, uh, especially his father. Uh, it's sort of interesting to read his life history. Um, he was well-schooled, well-educated, but the problem was his family was penniless. He was poor himself. He didn't have any money, 
Um, he tried to make some money as a, a private tutor, but if any of you have ever tried to do private tutoring, um, you find that you really can't make a lot of money at it. And so he did what was basically the only option left to him. He signed on with the monks. He became an Augustinian monk. Right? Well, okay, so the church is going to feed and clothe him, and then in return he's going to do some things for the church. But he also did a lot of things for science as well, and he continued to teach. Um, he also loved food. Okay, he, wasn't, he wasn't portly, but he did like to eat. Um, okay, so Mendel worked with peas, and uh, one of the main reasons he worked with peas was just because they were available to him to work with. And this figure in your book shows basically how Mendel worked with peas, but this is how um, we work with uh, doing genetics in, in plants quite a bit. Um, you have to be careful about uh, peas because they're self-fertile. That means that they can, the flowers can fertilize themselves, and, and if they fertilize themselves, then perhaps that's a cross you don't want. So you have to be, be controlling of the flowers. So the first step um, up here at the um, top left of this figure is to cut the stamens from the flower that's going to become the female flower. Remember, the stamens are the part that carries the pollen, which is the male part of the, of the flower. So you cut those off, and that's uh, basically a female flower now. What you can then do is transfer pollen from the male, and I use the term quotes because we're just using it as a male because we're taking pollen from it. You take pollen from the male, and you simply use a paintbrush to brush that pollen onto the carpal of the female. In that way, fertilization occurs. All right, so then the seeds are allowed to mature. Um, then you take those seeds out of the pod, you plant them, and you get the next generation, which is called the F1, or first filial generation. So the parental generation, we produce seeds, we grow those seeds to produce the offspring, which are the F1, or first filial generation. Then you just cross the F1s to each other to get an F2. In the case of peas, you don't even have to cross them to each other. They're self-fertile, so you can just let them self-fertilize. Right. So that F2 then is called the second filial. You could take these individuals and cross them again to produce a third filial or an F3. So you can keep going as many times as you want. Mendel didn't do too many crosses beyond the F2 because he didn't need to. These first two crosses basically told him everything he needed to know about these processes. Okay. These are the traits that Mendel worked with, uh, flower color, he looked at purple versus white, flower position, seed color, seed shape, pod shape, pod color, um, and stem length. And in all of these traits, he found the same basic patterns of uh, inheritance of the characteristics, which was really interesting. All right, so why did he study, why did he study peas? Um, in general, these are characteristics that you want of any critter you're doing, gonna do classical genetics with. And it's one reason why humans are not a very good test subject for doing classical genetics, not to mention the fact that doing controlled crosses with humans is somewhat unethical. So we have to have other ways of doing it. Um, they have a relatively short generation time. Well, obviously humans don't. Um, so that's a strike against us. Um, peas was somewhere around, oh, 50, 60 days. They produce lots of offspring. Well, okay, uh, some human families produce lots of offspring, but you're thinking in the, in the teens, okay? Um, you know, family, families with 12, 13, 14 offspring are not unheard of. Um, but we're talking hundreds here. The better the numbers, the more offspring you have, the, the better your conclusions are in genetics. It's all a numbers game, as we'll find out. It's all statistics. So you want lots of offspring to be able to anal analyze your results. They differed in single characteristics. Remember, one of the things that was stymieing people in determining basic rules of inheritance was that people looked at too many characteristics at once. And it, it was confusing. They couldn't figure out 
um, how those traits were being inherited. So the trick here, then, is to look at single characteristics, looking at green versus yellow pods and nothing else. Okay? And in that way, that was a big breakthrough um, in terms of the thought process that's going on to try and figure out how this is working. They were easy to culture and cultivate. They didn't take up a lot of space. Um, that's one reason why people have used fruit flies for so long. You can keep them in little vials. You can have hundreds or thousands of vials on a, on a shelf in an incubator. All right, so they're easy to take care of. Right. And they were what was available. I, I don't think necessarily Mendel was thinking about all of these things when he first started working with peas. He said, oh, there's some peas out here. Oh, they have some interesting characteristics. I think I'll cross them and find out what happens. That's probably what his thought process was. Right. <clears throat> I was really lucky that that was what his thought process was doing at the time. All right, so let's look at some basic crosses and try to figure out what's going on. We'll try to use the same kind of thought process that, we, that Mendel would have used. We'll use an analytical thought process. We'll look at the data and ask, what do the data tell me is the process going on here? Okay. So um, in this first cross, we're going to take purple flowers and cross them to white flowers. All right, so we've got a purple flowered plant, a white flowered plant. We cross those two. That's the parental generation or P generation. Notice the parents are true breeding. Okay. Remember what I, uh, what I defined a true breeding um, last Friday. These are strains in which the offspring always resemble the parents for a given trait. Okay. Offspring always resemble the parents for a given trait. Write that down. You'll probably see it on an exam. Offspring always resemble parents for a given trait. That's another thing that might help you out is on exams. I think a lot of people are missing some of the things I'm saying because they, they think that what I'm saying shouldn't be written down or doesn't make, isn't important. It's what's on the slide. To an extent, that's true. Right? But here's a definition I've just given you that you won't find unless you dig in the book. All right, so not everything I say up here is superfluous. All right, so true breeding. The offspring always resemble the parents for a given trait. That means that for these purple flowered plants, they always produce offspring with purple flowers. White flowers, the same thing. They always produce offspring with white flowers. All right, so we cross those two. We get the F1 generation, and everybody has purple flowers. It's like the white trait is poof, gone disappeared. Okay. Where did it go? Um, well, to answer that question, what Mendel did was take these F1 plants and cross them to each other to get an F2. Okay, in this case, since they're peas, you just self-fertilize them. It's really easy to do. All right, and the F2 shows this sort of arrangement. Three-fourths of the plants have purple flowers, but one-fourth have white. The white trait has reappeared in the F2 generation. Okay, so it was hidden. It was hidden in the F1. It was still there. It's just you didn't see it. And then all of a sudden, it reappears in the F2. Okay, so Mendel did the same kind of cross with all seven of the characteristics he was looking at. And he always came up with these three-to-one ratios. Okay, so he knew there was a fundamental rule of inheritance that was happening here. What was that rule? So what he did is he, he took these data and he, and he asked himself, you know, what do these data tell me? How can I explain these data uh, in this monohybrid cross? All right, so how to explain the data? Mendel proposed the, the next three basic rules. Traits are controlled by unit factors. Okay. He didn't call them genes, although we call them genes now. Right. Unit factors. They're par little particles in a sense. Right. And those particles are separate from each other. They can have alternate forms. For example, you can have a particle that controls the height of a plant such that it's tall. You can have a unit factor that controls the height of the plant such that it's short. 
Right? So those are height unit factors, but they're separate forms of those unit factors. There's a tall one and a short one. They're always present in pairs. There's always two copies. Okay, so what's going to happen then is if you have these two copies, they're going to be able to separate when you form gametes. Now, you can have dissimilar unit factors. I mean, imagine the situation where you have um, a unit factor that specifies tall and a unit factor that specifies dwarf plant. Or in our example, a unit factor that specifies purple flower versus one that specifies white. When those are both present in the, in the same individual, those dissimilar unit factors, then one of them masks the other. So the one that's expressed is dominant, and the one that is masked is recessive. That's his explanation for why the white flower trait disappears. He's saying purple is dominant to white. It masks white. All right, so his last point then is, if you have formation of egg and sperm, which you do in these flowers, then the unit factors separate. Okay, so you've got unit, two unit factors. They're separating out so that each gamete, each egg or sperm, gets one or the other, but not both. All right, and that makes perfect sense, because then when you get egg and sperm uniting, they come back together again, and you again have them in pairs. Okay? So in the parents, they're together in pairs. They separate out to form gametes. So now we've got separate gametes, egg and sperm. They come together when you get fusion of egg and sperm, and they're paired again. Okay? So the best way to look at this is then to, um, this is the law of segregation, and the best way to present this is to look at a figure. Okay? Let's see if it works. All right, now, let's take some time on this figure. Up at the top, we have the parental generation of plants. And we're di diagramming the genetic makeup of those plants by using symbols that represent the unit factors. Okay? So one of the plants has a big P, big P. Okay? Those are its unit factors. The big P is the purple factor. And the little P is the white factor. Okay, and notice that they are present in pairs in these individuals, according to Mendel's postulates. They're going to separate from each other when you form gametes, or sex cells. And so you're going to have eggs and sperm that only have one or the other. Okay, so... <coughs> For the big P plant, those unit factors separate to produce gametes that can only contain one P, and it happens to be big P, because that's all that's available. The little P plant produces gametes that are all little P. Again, that's all that's available. But they have to separate, okay? Because the gametes can only have one or the other, but not both. So now when these gametes fuse to produce the F1 plants, they're all big P, little p. Okay, remember, Mendel said that when dissimilar factors are present, one is expressed and the other is masked. The one that's expressed is dominant. The one that's masked is recessive. That's what we're seeing right there in the F1 plants. They're big P, little p. They're all purple flowered. That's where he gets his dominant and recessive concept. Okay, the purple is expressed. It's dominant. The white is masked it's recessive. But it's still there. It's just hidden. How does it come out? The way it comes out is to cross the F1s then to produce an F2. Okay, and that's what we're seeing here. The F1 plants, they're, when they form gametes, they separate those unit factors out. So that each gamete gets one or the other. 
Okay? Half of those gametes are going to have big P's and half of them are going to have little P's. So what happens then is if we take these plants and we look at what kinds of gametes they can produce, they can either produce big P's or little P's. The other plants can produce either big P's or little P's. And so what we do then is we just do all the possible combinations. We could have big P, big P, uh, little P, big P, big P, little P, and little P, little P. So those are all the possible combinations. Well, these two are the same. I mean, a big P and a little P, then they're a little P, big P, and a big P, little P aren't different from each other. So these we can just think of as both being uh, big P, little P's, carrying those dissimilar traits. Okay, then we have the big P, big P's, and then the little P, little P's. And out of these, since purple is dominant, these types are going to all be purple. <coughs> Only this type, where the little P, little P has come out, are going to be white. There's the 3 to 1 ratio right there. That explains Mendel's 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. So we apply his rule of segregation, the separation of those um, unit factors into gametes. And that's how we produce our F2. And we get a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay, this is how a classic monohybrid cross works. Whenever you see 3 to 1 ratio in the offspring, you know you're looking at a monohybrid cross, just like this one. Okay. A lot of times you can solve genetics problems by looking at the segregation ratios. 3 to 1 is a classic monohybrid. So if you look at a problem and you see a 3 to 1 ratio, you know what's going on. Okay, you're having big, say, big P's and little P's cross to each other to produce the next generation. <coughs> All right, any questions on that so far? Good. OK, at this point, I want to replace Mendel's terms with some modern terminology, because it's much easier to talk about these things using the modern terminology. Mendel's unit factors are, of course, genes. All right. um, we're not going to define what genes are in this class. We're just going to regard them as Mendel's unit factors and work with them as if they were these little particles um, in the cell. Even now, it's sort of hard to define what a gene really is, because if you look at them on the molecular level, they're so complicated that it's hard to have a generalization about them. Okay. So for our purposes, genes are Mendel's unit factors. And that's how we'll deal with them. Alleles. Okay, remember, Mendel said you could have unit factors that have different forms. For example, big P and little p. Right, those are different forms of a single gene. And so we call those alleles of a gene. A big P allele and a little p allele. Right, different forms of the same gene. That gene happens to control um, flower color. Um, in this example, the height of a, of a flower could be controlled by two alleles of a single gene. A, say a big T for tall and a little t for the dwarf plants or short plants. All right, so alleles are alternate forms of genes. Um, we have to be fairly careful when we talk about genes and alleles. A lot of people interchange those terms fairly freely. We don't want to. All right, um, homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous descri describes the state of the alleles that are present. If you have two alleles that are the same for a gene, that individual is homozygous. For example, big P, big P is, a, is homozygous. Little P, little P is homozygous. If you have, however, dissimilar alleles, say big P and little P in the same individual, that's heterozygous. Okay, because of the fact that it has those dissimilar alleles. And so homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous has the similar alleles. 
heterozygous has dissimilar alleles of a gene. Uh, okay, there's true breeding, strain in which offspring always resemble the parents. And due to homozygosity, that's why you get true breeding, because they're homozygous for a particular trait. Okay, we can describe the genetic state of the individual in two different ways. We can describe the physical characteristics, that is, what they look like, how they behave, their biochemical characteristics. That's all phenotype. Right? If I look at an individual and I say they have black hair, that's a description of the phenotype. Okay? I look at an individual and I say they're uh, uh, prone to nervousness. That's a phenotype. Doesn't mean it's a genetic phenotype. It means it's, a phenot it's just a physical characteristic. Right? Saying someone is nervous and saying that's a phenotype doesn't mean that that is caused by a genetic cause. And so it's just the physical characteristics, whether or not there's a genetic cause to it. With genotype, however, we are describing the alleles that are present. If I say an individual has black hair and they are um, uh, big B, big B, then I've described their genotype by saying they're big B, big B. I've described the alleles that are present. Okay, so genotype describes the alleles for a particular gene or genes. Um, for the purple flowered plants, I could say a purple flowered plant is big P, little p. That's actually more information than if I just say it's purple. Because if, it if I just said purple, it could be big P, big P, as well as big P, little p. Either of those gives you a purple flowered P. So the genotype sometimes is better than the phenotype in terms of describing what's going on genetically. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Okay, so those are most of the major terms that, that we can apply to Mendel's work, and I'll use these terms pretty regularly from now on. All right, so we look at monohybrid crosses where you have true-breeding individuals. They produce an F1 that carries dissimilar alleles. Those alleles segregate out, and when you cross those individuals, you get a three-to-one ratio of the two characteristics, the two traits. Mendel was really curious about what would happen if you had two traits segregating at the same time. Okay, what if you have plants that have purple versus white flowers, but they also have, I don't know, yellow versus green seeds? How do those traits interact? Do they interact? Okay, if you have a plant that's purple with green seeds, are its offspring also going to be purple with green seeds? Are the traits inherited together or separately? That's the question that he was asking. Okay. Um, what he did then is he looked at crosses where he had two traits that were separating or segregating. These are called dihybrid crosses, and they're a little bit more complicated than a monohybrid cross, but not terribly so. Right, so we have to keep track of um, a few more alleles. All right, there's two possible outcomes. Um, what we want to do with this is apply sort of a uh, hypothetical approach uh, and, and ask what are the possible outcomes of such a cross that we can think of. All right? The traits could segregate together or they could, they could not have any influence on each other at all. They could segregate completely separately. They could separate out without um, affecting each other at all. And so those are the two possible outcomes. What would we observe under these two hypotheses? That's the next question. All right, so here is the hypothesis of dependent assortment. <clears throat> We're looking at uh, round versus wrinkled seeds and yellow versus green <coughs> seeds. All right, so we have an individual that produces seeds that are round and yellow. We're showing that that is a dominant trait, but you could know that by looking at the F1. Um, here's an individual that produces seeds that are wrinkled and green. All right, now, you apply Mendel's rules of um, segregation to this cross, just like we did for the monohybrid. 
Unit factors separate, segregate from each other when you form gametes. But you have to have at least one R and one Y. Okay? So you have one R, one Y in those gametes because these are different genes. So we have a big R, big Y. Those are the gametes that are produced by this individual. Little r, little y is produced by this individual. And that's all you've got. So you cross those two, and you end up getting a heterozygote. Okay? It's big R, little r, big Y, little y. You look at it, and you see that it's yellow seeds, and the seeds are round. So you know which traits are dominant. Those are the ones that are expressed in the F1. All right, so we look at this individual and we say, OK, the yellow is dominant, the uh, round seed is dominant. But what's going to happen if we cross these to each other? Under the dependent assortment hypothesis, there's only two possible types of gametes we could get. Okay, you can get big R, big Y, or little r, little y. What we're saying here is that the parental states the big R, big Y, and the little r, little y have to be maintained under dependent assortment. So we get big R, big Y gametes and little r, little y gametes, and that's all you can get under this hypothesis. The result is that you would expect a 3 to 1 ratio of round yellow to wrinkled green under this hypothesis. All right. So only two possible types of gametes produced. The R's and the Y's have to stay together. That's not what Mendel observed. All right, so that hypothesis is false. You have to throw that hypothesis out because the experimental data contradicts it. Instead, this is what Mendel observed. And I know many students wish that he had observed the first one because it's a lot easier to understand. This is not difficult, OK? Don't worry, don't worry. It looks a lot more complicated than it is. Now, here's the, here's the key. Once again, we have um, true breeding strains. They produce only one type of gamete, either big R, big Y, or little r, little y. Here's our heterozygote in the F1, big R, little r, big Y, little y. Now, the key, the trick to this is to realize that you can have all possible combinations of gametes from the heterozygote at equal frequencies. All possible combinations, as long as there's one R and one Y in them. So that's where we get all of these gamete types. You could have big R with big Y, little r with big Y, big R with little y, or little r with little y. Those are all the possible combinations that you could have. Since both parents are the same genotypes, we get the same thing over here for the sperm. Big R, big Y, little r, big Y, big R, little y, little r, little y. Okay, and then we simply do all the possible combinations of these eggs and sperm. So we have big R, big Y with big R, big Y. So there's the genotype of the offspring that results. Big R, big R, big Y, big Y. Right, so that's all that we're doing in each of these squares is combining the appropriate gamete. We've got a big R, big Y combined with a little, little r, big Y. That produces this thing. Right, so you just fill in this table with all of those combinations and ask, what are the frequencies of the different types? Right, well, anybody that has a big R and a big Y, irrespective of what other alleles they carry is going to be yellow round. So we've got what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of those. Okay, so nine, nine out of 16 yellow round. Um, if they have a little y, little y, they're going to be green. Right? And if they have a big R, they're going to be round. So we've got three individuals here that are round, but they're little y, little y, so they're green seeds. There's three sixteenths there. We've got um, individuals that are little r, little r, and as a result, they're wrinkled. And if they're big Y, they're going to carry, or they're going to be yellow. Okay? So we've got three individuals there that are like that. So there's our three yellow wrinkled. And we've got only one lone individual out of here that is little r, little r, little y, little y, and so it's green and wrinkled. So the result is we've got 16 possible combinations 
Out of those, nine are yellow round, three are green round, three are yellow wrinkled, and three are green wrinkled. So we see a 9 sixteenths to 3 sixteenths to 3 sixteenths to 1 sixteenth, or a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. So that supports the, the uh, hypothesis, or the data support this hypothesis. So we know that that's, in fact, what's happening. They're segregating independently. Um, OK, I'll stop here, and we'll do some examples of this on Monday just to refresh your memory.